Hey everybody, what's going on and welcome to Guns N' Roses Central and welcome to another episode of Guns N' Roses True Story. Now with the 30th anniversary of Appetite for Destruction right around the corner, I thought what better topic to discuss than of course the album Appetite for Destruction. The only other album I've really done a full true story on is everyone's favorite, The Spaghetti Incident. So let's talk about Appetite for Destruction. I'm not going to give too much attention to the individual songs because I covered those in my True Story episodes. I just want to talk about the album in general. Now, a lot of the songs that you've heard on Use Your Illusion, or at least a handful of the songs, like Back Off Bitch, You Could Be Mine, November Rain, and Don't Cry, uh, could have been included on Appetite for Destruction. Now, there's a couple of reasons why some of these songs weren't included. So November Rain wasn't included because they already agreed to put Sweet Child of Mine on the record and thought they didn't, they didn't need any more than one ballad. Uh, Don't Cry wasn't included because according to Duff, they actually didn't have the budget to actually spend time to make the song the final version that you hear on the Use Your Illusion records. So if you guys have read Slash's book or Duff's book or even McWall's book, Last of the Giants, uh, one of the things that really stood out is how long it took Guns N' Roses to actually find somebody to produce their record. And a lot of the producers that were recommended for Appetite came through Geffen executive Tom Zutat, who actually discovered the band back in the LA club days. So Guns N' Roses first set off to work with Nazareth guitarist Manny Charlton. They had worked together at Sound City, and they had worked on several songs, including November Rain and Welcome to the Jungle. So Manny Charlton was chosen because Axel was a huge Nazareth fan. And if you guys, of course, have heard the Spaghetti Incident, you would have known that Guns N' Roses covered Hair of the Dog on that album. And there's actually an interview where Manny Charlton talked about uh, his time he spent working with Guns N' Roses. So I've linked to that interview down below. Now, in Mark Cantor's book, Reckless Road, he actually interviewed Manny Charlton. And he talked about how Tom Zutat actually came over to Scotland and asked him to actually produce the band. And uh, so basically the story goes, Tom Zutat came over to Scotland and asked me if I was interested in producing the band. At that time, I was recording an album with Nazareth called Cinema. So I had commitments of my own band and the schedule was kind of tight. He asked me to come to LA and meet the band anyways. The board mixes that Tom brought with him weren't very good. I couldn't hear the vocals properly. I said to Tom, let's get to the bottom of this. Let's go to the studio, cut their set live, straight to two track, and I can listen to the songs and get a handle on it. When I arrived in LA, I was supposed to see them the next day for rehearsals. Tom picked me up to go to the rehearsal space and there was nobody there. No, None of them even showed up. We hung around for a while and I looked at him and asked, are you sure you know what you're doing here? To me, that was not very professional to have a guy travel 6,000 miles to see a rehearsal and none of them even showed up. We went to the studio for three days. I asked them to cut their set, everything that they were doing at the time. We just cut, li- cut it live off the floor studio. Axel was stuck in between two studio doors with a little window watching the band and he gave it his all. He didn't bitch about it and there were no tantrums about not being able to perform. He just got on with it. Manny talked about some of the standout songs he remembered from his actual sessions with Guns N' Roses. He said, I thought the standout songs were Welcome the Jungle and November Rain. Axel was playing the piano and Izzy was doing a little bit of background vocals and it was fantastic. That's when I went, wow, there's proper songwriting skills there and I thought I would really like to produce the album. Unfortunately for Manny, things did not end up working out that way. So Manny Charlton told Tom Zutat, I told Tom about my commitments with Nazareth. What happened was I never heard from them after our sessions, and then Appetite came out. I got the feeling that Slash wasn't particularly impressed. I don't think he was as big of a Nazareth fan as Axel was. The only positive thing I heard from was from Izzy. He said, Manny's really cool. And according to Manny Charlton, he said, ultimately, I think they wanted somebody who wasn't going to interfere with what they were trying to do and who would get a great performance out of them. They didn't want to be disciplined by anybody. They had their own internal discipline, and they didn't want that coming from anybody from the outside and tell them what to do. Following their sessions with Manny Charlton, uh, Guns N' Roses would start working with Spencer Proffer, or he'd be, they'd be working with Spencer around the same time. Now, Spencer had produced uh, a number of records at Pasha Studios with acts including Cheap Trick, Heart, Little River Band, Eddie Money, Beach Boys, Wasp, and uh, Quiet Riot as well. So Spencer talked about working with Guns N' Roses. He said, we went into Pasha Studios, worked on pre-production for about a month, and we started making the record. We zeroed in on four or five songs that we started arranging. I worked with them in a rehearsal studio on constructing the arrangements, the breakdown, and vocal approaches. Randy was waiting for the results of our work so he could quarterback the rest of their touring and the next chapter of their career. Now, during the time Spencer was working with them, uh, he was also expecting his first child. So his wife was actually going to be giving birth through cesarean section, and he actually had to call a band meeting to tell the band, I need to go to the hospital at so-and-so time. Can you guys show up? And we can just work for a set number of hours, and I can go see my firstborn son uh, at the hospital. 
So here's what actually went down when he told the band to show up at a certain time. So he said the band would come into the studio every day, late, drunk, stoned, or somehow effed up one way or another. I called a band meeting a couple days early, knowing that there would be a cesarean and that I wanted to be at the hospital spending the time with my family. I didn't want to abrogate my responsibility to work with the band, so I said to them, Would you, on the day of the birth, show up on time? Come to the studio at noon and I'll work, for, I'll work with you for five hours, then I'm leaving to go to the hospital to spend the evening with my newborn son. They, of course, swore that they would. On the day, the hours passed, and they didn't show. Close to 5 o'clock, they show up collectively. Slash came in, and he couldn't wait to get to the bathroom. So he took his stick out and pissed on the wall of the studio. Axel went into the control room, and he threw up on the control board and asked if I wanted to go party with him. When I refused, he told me to get effed, forget fatherhood, and that if I left, I was an asshole. He said I either work with Guns N' Roses and rock or be a dad, but I couldn't do both. I told him to get effed. I told him that to never show up in my studio again. I walked out and called the Geffen people the next morning. I told them that I was out. That was the end of my involvement. I sold the tapes back for next to nothing because I didn't want these people in my life. Karmically, ethically, or otherwise, I thought they were the scum of the earth. I left a lot of money on the table after however many millions of albums sold, but I don't regret it because I have my integrity. Now, Slash seems to dispute uh, some of Spencer's stories. He says... I just don't recall any of that. We recorded Sweet Child of Mine, we recorded Night Train, and a couple of other things during that time at Pasha. We did all the live stuff for Live Like a Suicide. We did finish the arrangement of Welcome the Jungle. The songs didn't sound better than the demo quality, so we didn't achieve record quality status. We were trying to check him out and get a certain sound out of him, and we moved on because we thought he couldn't, it didn't capture it. We didn't think that the stuff we recorded was album quality. If he thinks he fired us, I think that's BS. Or else I didn't know about it and Tom didn't tell us. That's a possibility. Now following their work with Spencer, Guns N' Roses also met with uh, KISS member Paul Stanley. However, they were turned off to Paul Stanley after he suggested they needed to rearrange Welcome to the Jungle and expand Steven Adler's drum kit. And here's a rant that Axel did about Paul Stanley from uh, two shows. One is in 1987, I believe, and the other one's in 1988. Before we get into the next song, we did a few interviews downstairs. And it seems like there's a lot of older generation rock stars who got a lot of shit to say about us. And you see a lot of other bands, new bands, copying a lot of other people. Now we try to draw off things and learn some roots, but we ain't trying to be nobody but ourselves and have a good fucking time. Well, people like Paul Stanley from Kiss can suck my dick. And some of these old guys that say we're ripping them off, maybe they should listen to some of their early albums and remember how to play them. Well, we met with Paul Stanley about a year ago. He came over, we had a little talk. We're talking about possibly producing our record. He listened to Welcome to the Jungle and he goes, This is a good song, but we're going to have to get it, bitch. We're going to have to rewrite it to make it a pop bit. And we're going to have a conversation. So, I'm going to take this to you people for helping us get there in the pop band and you can suck that shit. Now, Slash has also had his falling out with Paul Stanley, and then he became friends with him again. So he was on Howard Stern's show in 2014, and Howard asked Slash if he told Paul Stanley to F off. That was the rumor. So Slash said that has come up a lot lately around 2014. So he said it happened in the 80s, and he did an interview with the LA Times and said some derogatory things about Paul Stanley. So then he said about six months later, he called up Paul Stanley and asked him something, and he'd forgotten what he said. So... Basically, Paul Stanley had an endorsement with uh, a guitar company and Slash wanted some of those guitars to record Appetite with. I think it was BC Rich. And then Paul Stanley basically told Slash, you shouldn't air your dirty laundry in public. And then 15 years went by and Slash and Paul Stanley didn't speak. And then it, was only, it wasn't until the 2000s when Slash did a VH1 tribute show to Kiss that they sort of became friends again. So following their uh, brief chat with Paul Stanley, Guns N' Roses were still looking for a producer. At that time, Tom Zutat had a couple names that he came up with, including Bill Price because of his great engineering from Roxy Music to the Sex Pistols and Mike Klink. And Mike Klink had engineered some of the great UFO records. And Axel Slash and uh, Tom Zutat actually had a conversation about how great those UFO records were, especially the live record Strangers at Night. So Tom Zutat went on to contact Mike Klink, talk to him, and he basically introduced him to the band. And Mike was looking to step out of engineering role at the time and move into more of a production role, so it seemed perfect. 
He subscribed to the theory that about the band having their creative control and the band would basically be co-producing and Tom Zutat would be heavily involved as an A&R person riding shotgun over the whole thing. So Mike Klink recalled how he actually got the call from Geffen Records and went and actually became the producer. So he said, I got a call from my manager, Terry Littman, that I had a meeting to set up at Geffen Records. I went to Tom Zutat's office. Tom, Alan Niven, and Axel were there, and they played some records that I worked on. They said, we like this record, we don't like that record. The records that they liked the most that I had worked on were the UFO records, especially Strangers at Night. That's the record they really loved. They also played me some failed attempts at some previous recordings that the band had made that no one was happy with. The recordings weren't right and they didn't represent the angst and energy that the band had. It was a little too processed, which was the sound in that day. People tended to make things very processed sounding, very slick, and they were looking for something a little more raw. So they were looking for someone to come in, fix it, facilitate it, and capture the Guns N' Roses sound. So basically they set up with an idea of how to actually audition Mike Klink. So Mike Klink said what they wanted me to do was to go into the studio with them and record one song and see how it turned out. So we went into the studio and I recorded Shadow of Your Love. During that process it was a matter of getting that band to trust me and understand that I had their best interests at heart. So after they had actually finished recording Shadow of Your Love and basically had given the mix of a song to the band, his phone rings at about 4 o'clock in the morning and it was Axel. He said, this is great, I love it, let's start tomorrow. So that does it for this episode of Guns N' Roses True Story, where we took a look at the pre-production for Appetite for Destruction and how Guns N' Roses found a producer for the album. So tune into episode two later this week when we're going to be talking about the actual recording and tune in the whole week where I'll also be talking about the 30th anniversary and talking about the Apollo show, as well as my recap of Guns N' Roses Radio on Sirius XM. So thanks for watching, guys. Leave your comments down below. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the contents of this video and if you want to see more, hit the subscribe button. And if you guys want to support my channel, you can always go to Patreon and pledge to my channel as well. Take care.